Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this Ice and Fire discussion video, we're going to be going over one of what I think is one of the best commanders in all of Baratheons, Courtney Penrose, the Castellan of Storm's End. So I think I make a pretty strong claim here to say that Courtney Penrose is one of the best, if not the best, commanders available to the Baratheons right now. And I think a lot of it has to do with how his strategy really folds well into what the Baratheon units are bringing in general, especially on Renly's side. So let's take a look at his tactics cards and see if I can kind of justify my claim here. The first one we come across is Defensive Counter. This triggers when an unactivated, friendly combat unit is attacked with melee before the attack dice are rolled. That attacker then becomes weakened, and the attack loses all abilities until the end of the turn. Now, we've seen this card on Donald Noy before, and I'm a super huge fan of Donald Noy in Night's Watch, so it's not a surprise that I'm really digging this one right now. Uh, oftentimes, Baratheon units are stacked with armor, especially on the... Renly side. So having something like this to mitigate what your opponent brings to kind of deal with that armor brick is really nice. You can take away Sundering or Critical Blow. Anything that they happen to have in a specialized unit that's coming at your more tanky units is going to be welcome with defensive counter. Next up, we've got Surprise Strategy. This triggers at the start of any turn. Opponent simply can't play Tactics cards this turn. You then remove this card from the game instead of discarding it when it's played. And if you happen to control the Missive Zone, you can also return one Tactics card from your discard pile to your hand. So this is another repeat card. We see this in the base uh, tactics deck for neutrals and neutrals if they have anything going for them it is all kind of con concentrated in their tactics cards and it's nice to see this one kind of coming back here uh, not only does it stop your opponent from doing what they want to do whether you're on the offensive or defensive this turn uh, it also sets you up for getting cards that you might have lost uh, previously. And, and, and lost is a weird one. You might have played them and gotten their effect out of it, but it allows you to keep some of these cards that let you press the advantage really hard. Or if your opponent does happen to be playing with some kind of discard shenanigans, uh, this can help you get those back too. Surprise strategy uh, seems very simple when you first play it, but I think it's a super utility card and essentially doubles just about any other card that you want to have in your deck as long as you've played it already. Finally, we have Counterplot. This triggers when an opponent plays a tactics card, and then you roll a die. On a 3+, plus, you cancel the effects of that tactics card. You also get to re-roll this if you happen to control the crown zone. And this is another card that we've seen already in the base Lannister deck. So Courtney Penrose kind of takes a lot of these uh, strategies that we've seen in other factions and puts them to good use here. Counterplot is just a phenomenal card. I think it's one that kind of gives people these cringes in the back of their teeth uh, whenever they've set up a really cool play and they've de they've been denied just because of this counterplot. And the crown zone isn't one that is extremely uh, sought after for a lot of factions, so this zone should be open, open quite frequently. And if it isn't for us to grab to make sure this card works, uh, it shouldn't be to I mean it's a three plus that it triggers on so you're you got like a 66 percent chance to make this work otherwise I think it goes down to what like a 16 percent chance to work if you have the crown I might be wrong on that one but uh, I know the percentage is quite high if you happen to get the reroll on three plus otherwise counterplot is phenomenal for trying to keep your units alive or stop your opponent from getting any kind of advantage that they might be getting through the cards they're playing like stopping a clutch sudden charge or or devastating impact can really throw a wrench in your opponent's gears and that's kind of what all of the cards that Courtney Penrose happens to be bringing they're all meant to slow down your opponent control the game he's solid for just going into that hard control game plan and one of the things that really works well with the Baratheons is that they have a lot of units that can take these hits especially if you're taking away any kind of special rules your opponent might have to drop them down uh, think of uh, losing a unit and then stopping uh, overrun or something like that from a Targaryen player that's a, a really clutch play and things like counterplot or uh, surprise strategy can really slow those things down for your opponent and allow you to make them play the game at your pace. I know I talk about tempo a lot in this game, and the control that Courtney Penrose brings combined with the tempo set of 
Baratheon seem to be a match made in heaven, in my opinion. And if it wasn't enough that Courtney Penrose brings all of this, all these controlling elements to the game, he also happens to be a Commander NCU, which is also another form of interesting control because we're kind of freeing up points to just bring an extra unit. That's always one of the weird things when we talk about how powerful Commander NCUs are. Um, when you look at the attachment versions, oftentimes those attachments have a quite they have quite a powerful effect on the game, but commander NCUs end up bringing you a whole nother activation. So they almost have, I wouldn't say more value, but uh, when it comes to points, they obviously have more value. So the ability that Courtney brings tacked on to him is an influence ability. So when he claims the zone, he gets to influence any unit. And while he's influencing an enemy combat unit, each time that unit is targeted by the tactic zone, one of my combat units within long range can heal D3 wounds. So Baratheons already kind of have a slight theme of healing a little bit in them. It's not overt, but there are definitely some things in this army, especially on Renly's side, that can play into the healing game. So if we happen to be influencing our opponent's unit to keep them off of the, uh, the combat zone or the maneuver zone, uh, those things will allow us to... That, I mean, it's it allows our opponent to it makes our opponent make a choice, right? They have to choose whether they want to get that retreat or extra m maneuver or heal a unit that they might have been working on for a while. One of the interesting plays with this is you could just end up taking the tactic zone if you want to, just to gain some cards, put a weakened token on a opposing combat unit, and that'll leave that combat zone open if you've got that top of the turn. And if Courtney's the one who's done this you get to influence that unit that's more likely to take that combat zone and then your opponent's got to make that choice of i'm weakened and this unit's going to be healing d3 wounds if i take a swing on it is this something that i really want to do and they either choose to pivot off of that giving you the combat zone or they happen to take the combat zone some and, and not do anything with it you know target a unit that's not in combat at all or that doesn't have a ranged attack and then they're just kind of spinning their gears early in the turn there's a lot of uh, momentum to be gained off of a play like this. And I think Courtney Penrose might not seem like the greatest NCU in the universe, but he definitely messes with your opponent's activations a little bit if you play it right. So after looking at the spoilers that we had seen or the teasers from the CMON Expo that had happened recently, uh, Stannis got a lot of love in terms of uh, releases that were coming out. Uh, so and when I say a lot, I mean they got an extra unit, right? But uh, Renly's side didn't really get any of that, so we're going to kind of work within the construct that we have right now with him. I am bringing a unit that's not released just yet, but bear with me, we'll get there. Uh, the first thing I am going to bring in this list is a unit of Rose Knights. Now, the, the Rose Knights have a little bit of synergy with Courtney Penrose's... Uh, healing ability imagine now that same situation that i had spoke of earlier and this will apply to your opponent trying to heal their unit as well and then uh, once they do that not only are they going to have to watch you heal d3 wounds on something like rose knights but then have those wounds kind of reflected not reflected back at them they'll at least take one so uh, having a unit with a really good armor save and some already built-in synergy with the uh uh, the healing is nice here. It's not the only reason we're taking them, of course. They have a decent they have decent combat output and are just a solid unit in general for anything loyalty Renly. I think this unit is one that people worry about a lot in that it's hard to take down and even more so because you're incentivized to heal it a bunch. So it's not something that I think anyone wants to see. And when you combine that with the controlling elements of Courtney Penrose, you end up getting a really good recipe for a disastrous unit on your uh, when it comes to your opponent's plans for the game. I'm also bringing two units of Baratheon Wardens in this list. And uh, again, they're just a cheap unit. I've talked about them a ton. I think they're kind of the backbone of all Baratheon lists. I think you'll be hard-pressed to find a list ever, whether it's Renly or Stannis, that doesn't have one, if not at least two of these in there. They just have a solid save stat. They'll sit on objectives all game, and when push comes to shove, they can actually get some damage out. They don't hit very well with that 4+, plus, but they're throwing 7 dice in the beginning, and with their Warhammer ability, uh, we can kind of mess with condition tokens if we have to happen to be putting those out as well. They're a very cheap activation that's very difficult to dislodge. For the next unit, I'm taking a big chunk out of our points, bringing a unit of the Champions of the Stag. Now, these aren't released yet, and I think they're still in that TBD 
area, but they're 10 points. They are basically the second coming of Flayed Men, right? Although they're probably their combat output's a little bit different than theirs. I mean, the original Flayed Men. But they are a cavalry unit for Baratheons that's speed four, which isn't super great. But when you figure their cavalry, they get to do that extra maneuver before they activate. So they, they shouldn't be having too many problems getting to where they want to. They uh, hit on threes. They throw eight dice with full rank, six dice with, uh, with uh, missing one rank. They've got that awesome two plus save and amazing morale of five plus these guys are really difficult to take down and once they get stuck in it's going to be hard to get them out now the uh, other fun rules that they bring are champions wrath they just have critical blow all the time and if the defender rolls any ones on their defense saves they become weakened so this is another way to keep these guys sticking around a long time making sure that your opponent stays weakened so if they end up connecting first uh, th the chances of them wiping this unit out or doing a ton of wounds to them to knock a rank off are extremely slim they also happen to have the parry ability so when this unit's attacked with melee uh, for each attack die roll of one, the attacker suffers one wound. So there's not only do they have some some extra offensive capabilities, they have some defensive capabilities that translate into offensive ones. This unit's really strong, and even though it's 10 points for a speed four unit or movement four unit, uh, they they just feel so welcome in Baratheons like we have a hard time connecting early or getting scenario relevant when we're bringing a lot of four speed units like we have in the rest of this list between the Rose Knights and the uh, Baratheon Wardens but given that the champions of the stag can go up there and kind of pick the fights that we don't want our back lines fighting right away or just kind of tearing up the backfield of our opponent once we get there makes them a really strong choice for any Baratheon list. But for this one in particular, it means that if our opponents try to focus in on taking them down, all of the things that Courtney Penrose brings for us in tactics cards end up just making these guys a much bigger monster. If we reflect back to my strategy with uh, keeping the Rose Knights engaged and leveraging the influence of Courtney Penrose, your opponent might get... Uh, get the rug pulled out from under them if they think that you're going to utilize the rose knights or utilize the uh the influence from courtney pren rose to heal the rose knights and then just end up healing one of these guys if they've been working on them too there's a lot of uh equal threats that are very difficult to take down in this list so if you're doing things to keep these champions the stag full uh, it means your opponent's going to have a hard time figuring out whether they want to really focus down on Champions of the Stag or the Rose Knights. And whichever one they choose, chances are you're going to have something to say about it with all of those awesome cards that Courtney brings with him. The final unit that I've decided to bring in this list is Stormcrow Mercenaries. So I had the extra points left over to get a fifth combat unit in, so we've got our three NCUs and five combat units. I guess that's a little bit of a spoiler for the rest of the list, but um, the Stormcrow Mercenaries, I just wanted them in there to have a little bit faster unit. I mean, it's not much faster. Speed five isn't a huge deal, but when you've got a bunch of speed four uh, tin cans wandering around, I think that it's a welcome addition. The, the real reason why I want these in here is to leverage the adaptive ability, because a lot of our units are kind of ho-hum on their own outside of the uh, uh, champions of the stag even the rose knights they've got a lot of cool rules but they don't have any like flashy bells and whistles to them but by giving a decent attachment to this unit we can try and turn them into a little bit more of a menace on the table that our opponent really can ignore the attachment that i've decided to include for them is brienne the maiden of tarth and the knightly vow ability i think is one that i've touched on before but it can really control your opponent's deployment strategy and since we have uh five combat units in here we can hold this unit off to the end to make sure that we can react to whatever our opponent puts down and the champions of the stag are actually quite maneuverable so we can get them pretty much wherever we want to and make sure that they affect the table our opponent has a lot to worry about when it comes to deployment strategy against this list and knightly vow just adds an extra layer to that one of the things that the stormcrow mercenary mercenaries don't really bring is a really great attack stat i mean they're looking really close they're they're basically the same as the Baratheon Wardens, but when we get uh, Brienne in there and put them on their Nightly Vow target, they end up rolling a ton of dice, so the fact that they don't hit very well doesn't matter, and then that's ignoring the fact that Nightly Vow lets you hit better. 
the real big benefit we get out of this is even if we can't connect with our nightly vow target, we end up going to a five plus morale. And that's probably the worst part of the Stormcrow mercenaries is that they just can't exist through the panic game. And this gives us a pretty decent and respectable morale stat once you put that all together. Now, one of the things you could do is drop Brienne from these guys completely and then maybe shuffle over the extra point to another unit to maybe give the Rose Knights a little bit more ferocity or maybe change up the attachments that happen to be in the Baratheon Wardens. I've been a big fan of putting uh, Stormcrow lieutenants in that unit just to make them a little bit more dangerous, but then you also get your Stormcrow lieutenant put in the Stormcrow mercenary unit, so there's a lot of ways you can adapt this list and change it to fit your needs but for me I just feel like uh, Brienne adds an additional layer of uh, complication for our opponent to deal with and I think the more complicated we can make things for them the better. For NCUs we of course have Courtney in this list but then we're going to add in Shira Errol. She's kind of, in my opinion, very staple for the Baratheons. She comes in at three points, which is one of the real attractions for her. But we there's two zones we obviously want with this list. We want the coin to turn on um, the Rose Knights and make sure that our other units are staying nice and full so we can out-attrition our opponent. But we also want to try and get that missive position because a lot of the cards in Courtney's deck, whether it's the, the just the normal Baratheon cards or his tactics cards that he brings are really important to our game plan, especially when we think about what we need to uh, get some of the, like getting surprise strategy to work is really important for us. So uh, being able to get the benefit of either of those zones without really sacrificing the some of the benefits of the other one is really nice. I think uh, being able to take the missive and then remove a vulnerable token from one of our good units uh, is a really important move for us. So Shira Arrow locks down her place as a three-point NCU in this list. The third NCU that I'm bringing is Marjorie Tyrell. And her ability, a rose and its thorns, uh, activates whenever she claims a zone on the tactics board. You can then restore one wound to a friendly infantry unit or deal one wound to an enemy infantry unit. So this is pretty much set for the Rose Knights, but we can also use this to push the attritional advantage just a little bit or keep some Baratheon Wardens around. Uh, when we look at the attack value of the Wardens and the Stormcrow Mercenaries, if we happen to be in a position where one wound get, coming back to that unit is going to get them up to that spicy seven attack dice, then that's a good chance to use something like this. I think if I had two units of Rose Knights, I'd probably be a lot more interested in having Marjorie Tyrell in here, but there's definitely an argument to be made to pull out Brienne of Tarth, put in the Stormcrow Mercenary on that Stormcrow unit, and then possibly upgrade Marjorie Tyrell into Walder Frey. And that's uh, another interesting line of play. It means that our opponent's going to be more interested in taking the crown zone away from us, which kind of hurts the effectiveness of counterplot a lot, which is really the the big downer for putting Walder Frey in this list. But bringing another piece that can cripple a opposing unit means that we just get more control in there and we can still do wounds to things. Uh, for Marjorie Tyrell, the specifically only working on infantry units is kind of a holdback for her. If she could do things like just use the one wound to zap a dog or something, that would be really nice. But having Walder Frey can help us get there, even though I think that zapping a dog for one point isn't the greatest use of a five-point NCU. But uh, regardless, Marjorie Tyrell kind of sits in here right now, and if I got a few more games under my belt with Courtney Penrose, with Walder Frey, and then with Marjorie Tyrell, I probably could be uh, convinced one way or the other which one I think really fits well in here. But for right now, I think Marjorie Tyrell feels nice. So I hope you enjoyed this tactics discussion on Courtney Penrose. If you want to reject my claim that I feel like he's one of the best, if not the best commander in Baratheons, leave a comment below letting me know which one you feel is good or is, it takes his place and why they would do so. Uh, otherwise, any kind of requests or suggestions for commanders to talk about in the near future, uh, you can leave those in the comment section below as well. And as always, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.